Hello everyone, welcome to this channel. So in this video, we are going to discuss the fourth chapter of IGCSE Computer Science, which is software. And before we discuss the various types of software there are, let's first define what exactly is software. So software is basically a set of instructions written in a programming language that perform one or more tasks that tells computer what to do. So if you look at the most famous, some of the most famous software like Zoom, WhatsApp, and Snapchat, even the games 2048, they are all a type of software. But if you refer to the definition, they said that, that all the software are just some codes written in programming languages. Therefore, underneath each software here and every other software that you know, they are basically a bunch of codes that does very specific tasks. Even though they might have different user interface, they have different functions, but all of them are written in a programming language. All right. So there are two different types of software that we will learn, be learning in this syllabus. One is called the system software, which is a software that computer cannot live without. And the other type of software is application software, which does specific tasks. So let's first look into what is system software. It's a variety of programs that a computer needs to function. Just like um, we human needs um, food, water, and shelter to survive, a computer would need all this software to run um, without problems. And some examples are the basic input-output system, BIOS, which is installed in ROM. And this software enables all the attached components such as your mouse, keyboard, monitor to initialize. And the, the other name of the BIOS is also known as the firmware. And operating system, the Mac OS that you are using in your Mac or even the Windows that you're using in your Windows computer, they are all softwares and they are written in codes. All right. So the third example would be your device driver. So what the driver basically does is that it enables a hardware to communicate with the operating system. So um, I'm currently connecting my mic into my phone. So this is a type of um, collaboration between a hardware device and also the input device uh, and the software, um, which is enabled by this called the device driver. It's a code written to enable this hardware to communicate with the software, which is the operating system of my phone. Okay, um, the compilers, which translate high-level programming language into machine code, will definitely look more into that in the following subtopics. So, um, utility softwares, which is built into usually built into the OS to carry out a specific task. So, here are some of the examples of utility software. The first one is the antivirus software. We all know what it does. It count. It attacks. Um, the virus that tries to attack the computer and is offered by the operating system and it must be constantly updated. If you think about it, it makes sense because virus will keep evolving, Different the hackers will keep improving the virus and therefore this needs to be improved to the antivirus software. And how they work is that the software, again a bunch of code, they are running in the background constantly to check um, software or file before they are run or loaded. That's why you will see a um, confirmation before you want to open some files downloaded from unknown sources. And also compare a possible virus against a database of viruses. Um, if any programs and any possible files or program which are infected will be put into quarantine, which means they will be um, quarantined so that they don't affect other files, important files in your computer. So that's um, one type of utility software, which is a system software. And the other one is um, the defragmentation software. If you remember what we learned in chapter three hardware, we know that one of the problem of HDD, hard disk drive, is that defragmentation will occur. Um, if you look at this diagram on the left hand side, defragmented HDD will look like this, in which the data is being fragmented into different parts. Therefore, when the computer wants to read the hard disk, it becomes um, very slow because the moving head will need to move to one place to another and that will slow down your computer. So what the fragmentation software does is that if they will try to make the data that's scattered to gather together, just like the image that you see and 
diagram 2 on the right in which the data are nearby each other and this will enhance the speed of the CPU, um, the hard disk drive because it will be able to read all this data consequ um, consequently consecutively faster all right so that's what a defragmentation software does it is also a system software and also we have device driver x explain they are what they are the software that enables your hardware to communicate with your software and also your backup software um, they said that it's a good practice to use the operating system backup utility um, this they will usually schedule for backing up to happens and this allows um, the security and working, let's say um, you, I'm recording this video, um, the video will first store in my computer SSD and if you want to back up, you will also store it in an external HDD and also cloud. So this, um, sometimes this backup software, they help you to do this automatically without you having to do it manually. All right. So these are some of the um, example that you can check it out for if you are using a Windows computer it's called file history and if you are using Mac OS then it's called time machine and so what is the function of this system software right they what it does is that first of all they allow software and hardware to run without problem which is a job done by device driver and also provide a human computer interface which is done by the operating system so for instance, how do we actually communicate with computer? Um, the OS provides a survey for us to do, so whether you are in a touch screen or whether you communicate with it using your mouse or keyboard. So these are all tasks done by the OS. And that one, um, allocate, control the allocation and usage of hardware resources. How are the RAM allocated to each um, software? How, how are they allocated? Which we'll learn more about this in operating system video. Okay, so these are our system software in which they are needed for a computer to function. So let's look into the second type of software, which is application software. And it is defined as the software that a user needs to make use of the computer system, um, which means that even if your computer doesn't have this software, it's okay too, because this software are usually only serving a very specific purpose. So for instance, these are some of the um, application software like your word processor, spreadsheet, database, um, your apps, even the Google Chrome or Safari that you are using now, they are all application software. They are usually developed to uh, achieve a single purpose. Okay, so um, they are used to perform various applications on a computer, allow a user to perform specific tasks using the computer resources. Even your games are a type of application software. So um, to summarize, Soft, think of system software as the manager in which it's responsible for managing the hardware and also other software in the computer, right? Like the BIOS, OS, device driver, these are all they do. And as for application software, they allow the user to perform different tasks using the computer. And these tasks are usually very specific. For instance, Word document will only help you to um, write your essays, spreadsheet to store data, video editing software only allow you to edit a video. So these are called the application software. So um, in this video, we talk about the two different types of software a computer has, the system software, which is essential for a computer to work, and also the application software, which does specific tasks. So that's the end of this video. And in the next video, we are going to learn about what an operating system is and what are their functions. So I'll see you soon. Thank you. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to this video. So in the last video, we learned that there are two different types of software available, namely the system software and also the application software. So today we are going to dive deeper into one of the software, system software, which is known as the operating system, which is essential to make computer work. So here's some history about computers. So in the past, how we run the program is first, the program will be written into something called a punch card. And when this program needs to be run, a, a human has to insert this punch card into the computer. And this is extremely inefficient because if you were to run multiple programs, you will need to um, manually insert this punch card into a computer. Therefore, what they say here is that they slow down computation and it's also very difficult to integrate a hardware with the computer. 
because for each hardware, let's say you have a mouse, you will need a program that helps the mouse to communicate with the CPU. If you have a keyboard, you will need a, another software to do that. And therefore, we need a way in which program can program automatically. And this leads to the creation of operating system, a middleman that helps us operate the computer. So um, here is some fun fact about how punch card is like. All this punch card can only store data up to five megabytes, um, which for now we have improved a lot. So um, let's talk a little bit more about um, the operating system and some of the functions that it has. So first of all, it is a system software and it has the privilege of managing other programs. As it, only this software has this ability, for instance, your um, video editing software cannot possibly affect um, your video game software, but OS can does that, can do that. And it is the first program to be launched by the BIOS when the computer is turned on. It is the first software that is being run the moment you turn your computer on. And then it is an intermediary, a middleman between the software program and also the hardware peripherals. And this OS is usually stored within the SSD or HDD and it's only loaded into the RAM when a particular action needs to be carried out, which means not the entire OS code is loaded into the RAM, only those parts that are needed. So um, the two main functions here is that they enable computer system to function correctly and allow computers users to communicate with computer system. So um, in this video or in this syllabus, we are going to learn the seven main functions of the operating system. And after learning all this function, you will start to appreciate how important they are in a computer. So first of all is that operating system provides a human computer interface, which means an interface which allows the user to communicate with the computer. All right. So um, the first type of human computer interface that they provide would be a command line interface, which is um, more commonly used by a programmer in which um, if you were to use this command line interface like terminal, you will need to learn a number of commands and direct communication with the computer. You will have that and it's not restricted to a number of predetermined options. Okay? So the second type is what we all are more familiar with, which is the graphical user interface. If you were to open your desktop, you'll be, you'll be able to see that. It's the interaction of using pictures or symbols instead of command. So for instance, you want to delete an app on your desktop, you just have to click on the icon and the deletion will be done once um, by the operating system. So, um, so an example would be the WIMP or even your phone touch screen, how you can pinch to enlarge, zoom in and out or even rotate your screen, all right? So that's graphical user interface. The more recent one um, that we, we are learning here is called the voice command interface. Uh, in which you communicate with your computer by just saying something to it. Um, for instance, in iPhone, we have Siri and in Google, I believe it's called Google Assistant. So that's how um, these different methods, command line interface, graphical user interface, voice command, they kind of provided by the US OS to help us to communicate with the computer. All right. So um, let's compare, do some compare and contrast of CLI and GUI. So for command line interface, since we are in direct communication with the computer, um, it's very convenient, all right? And it also uses a small amount of computer memory. And the downside of this is that you will need to learn a lot of commands like CD for change directory, change directory, um, and also LS for listing. So these are the, some of the setback. Um, you can definitely check it out on YouTube on how this command line works because this is not the topic and the main focus of our syllabus so I'm not going to go deep into it. So, um, so that's the advantage and disadvantages. And as for graphical user interface, um, they are more user friendly and which they are easy to learn. You don't have to memorize anything. All right. And also they, however, one disadvantage is that they use up more computer memories because um, think of the processing needed to just simplify the process. So um, therefore the user, it uses more memories. And the second setback is that the user is limited to icons provided on the screen, which means you can't really communicate directly with the computers, only a preset. 
All right, so that's, um, here are some of the comparison. So first function of the operating system, to provide a human computer interface. All right, so the second function of it is memory management. So if you think about it, here we have a question here. When a program is needed, its code will be loaded from the secondary memory, like what we learned in hardware chapter, to the primary RAM. But if you think about it, who does the moving in and out job? And today we review the answer, which is the operating system. The operating system is the one that does that. Okay? It basically tracks of all the memory locations and carry out memory protection to ensure that two competing applications cannot use the same memory locations. And if you remember how RAMIS looks like, um, basically a bunch of different rectangles in which each box um, store different data. So these could be the code that is being run, the code that's being run at this time, okay? The code that's being run. So um, basic, what OS does is that they ensure that no the two the programs are not being loaded to the same location otherwise the program will crash so this is what os does it is also it will also make sure that enough hardware is allocated to perform the necessary process for instance how much ram should i allocate to this program for it to run smoothly without lagging all right so that's um, one thing that os does so the third function so the second function of it is memory management and the third function of the OS is to allow multitasking. How, do we ensure, how does OS ensure um, multiple applications can be open at the same time? For instance, opening on YouTube and a game at the same time. So um, each of the process will share hardware resources under the control of the operating system. So OS will allocate different hardware memory um, resources like RAM and CPU processing power to each of this process that is running the app that is running to just ensure that no program will crash. And also um, another type of multitasking is called a preemptive multitasking in which resources are allocated to a process for a specific time limit. And this process can be interrupted while it is running. And this process is given a priority so it can have resources according to its priority. So basically, um, since there are so many programs that need to be run at the same time, how, um, how does the OS decide which one needs to be run first and how it does it is to assign priority ranking to each of the process and this ranking will be used to determine which program should be given more resources and which should be run first. We will definitely talk more about that in our interrupt video. Stay tuned for that. So um, um, after multitasking, the fourth function of the OS is the hardware peripheral management. Um, if you look up to the meaning of peripheral, it means an auxiliary device used to put information into and get information out of computer. And some of the example would be a mouse, a keyboard, or even a projector, a projector. I hope that you see how the various hardware that we are learning comes into picture here. All right, so um, how do we ensure that these hardwares can work smoothly with our software? And this is done also by the OS, in which it has this software, which we already learned, known as the device driver. And it helps the input and output devices to communicate. And the second one is that they take data from a file and translate it into a format that the input and output device can understand. And it, they also ensure that hardware resources has a priority so that they can be used and released as necessary. So um, OS basically handles how this hardware and can be used to work with the software. And so next one, user account management. So if you were to log into your Google or your PlayStation Plus account, you will know that um, these a computer can have multiple user account at the same time. And how they, um, these functions are allowed is also via the operating system. So, and therefore what they say is important that user data is stored in separate parts of the memory for a security reason. For instance, um, here we have two users, Tom and Rose, that data will be different and also um, not transparent to each other. So they might need to be stored in different parts of their SSD or HDD, okay? So user account management. And for user account management, there's one person known as the administrator, which is kind of like the big boss. They oversee the management of this user account and they can create accounts, delete user account, restrict user account activities. So they can assign each user a rank in which each rank de determines 
what each user can do with their accounts. So that's one. Um, another thing that OS does is called the file management. How do they create, edit, delete a file? And also performing some specific tasks here, okay? File management. And maintaining the directory structures, all right? Ensuring memory allocation for a file by reading it from HDD and SSD. All this thing, when we were, if we were to open a video right now, how all of these files are being opened and run, they are all being carried out by the OS. If, so that's file management. And the other one is security management, which we'll cover more in depth in chapter five. But just a brief overview is that they ensure that OS ensure that anti-software virus software is always up to date. Um, in fact, in nowadays, you don't really have to buy an anti-virus software unless you are in a big company because um, usually your OS will provide all this antivirus software. And they maintain access right for all users, communicate with firewalls to check that traffic to and from the computer. And they also op offer the op ability to recover data when it's lost um, via a backup utility software. So these are the security part of the software. So if you look at into, um, now we have learned all the different functions of an OS. Um, hopefully you can start to appreciate how um, OS is so beneficial to us and how essential it is to make sure a computer runs, which means we don't have to install all this software ourselves. Um, it's like a all-in-one types of sort code. And to help you remember um, the seven functions of the operating system, um, I have created a acronym. So it's called whom, how are you feeling, son. So you can basically take each of this red color character um, to memorize um, the seven functions of the operating system, just in case they ask you in the exam, okay? So um, these are everything about the OS system. Hopefully you learned something from it. And in the next video, we are going to learn the process of how a computer's term is boot up and what is the sequence of software being run. And I'll see you in the next video. Thank you. So welcome everyone to this video again. And, and this video is going to be a relatively shorter one in which we'll discuss what is the sequence of um, programs being run, which software does run first when we power off our computer. Okay, so before we talk about the sequence, let us um, first look into the bio system, which is also known as firmware. It is a type of system software, if you remember. So it is a tangible electronic component with embedded software instruction. Okay, so the bio setting are stored in a CMOS chip, um, which is called complementary metal oxide semiconductor. Um, so this means that um, the bio setting will be reset once if the computer battery was removed and disconnected. And the key thing about bio is that it is responsible for booting up the computer by loading part of the operating system from secondary storage into the RAM. All right. So let's look into the application software running sequence. All right. So first of all, when you were to, if you were to power up your laptop or your CPU, the first thing that will run is the hardware in which um, the electricity will start flowing into the computer. And what happened next is that this hardware will load the BIOS program, which is located in the ROM. And the BIOS, the basic input output system, as the name implies, it checked that the hardware is working fine, such as the projector, the CPU, and also the RAM as such. So after that, this is the first software that the BIOS program will run. It will load the operating system. From, it will load it by transferring it from the secondary storage, your HDD or SSD, into your RAM to be run. And in turn, this operating system will start taking over and launch different types of application software that um, the computer needs to run. For instance, your video editing app, your Google Chrome, etc. So this is the sequence of how um, different types of software is run. First of all, we have the um, BIOS being loaded up, all right, when the electricity is turned on, and the BIOS will in turn loads the operating system, and then the OS will load the application software that um, the user wants to open. So that's the end of this video. I hope you can understand it. And in the next video, we are going to look into what exactly is an interrupt. I'll see you there. See you.
So hello everyone, welcome back to this channel. So in this video, we are going to learn about what exactly is an interrupt and what is its function. So if you were to look at the definition, an interrupt is where a signal that is sent from a device or a program to the OS that causes a temporary stop, which does what its name implies, interrupt the OS from doing something. And some examples of interrupt is that when you try to create two folders with the same name or um, when you try to perform a 5 divided by 0 in your calculator, um, something will happen. And other examples could be from a hardware um, port in which when the printer is out of ink, paper is jammed, a timing signal or even the soft software errors. So the function of all this interrupt is to cause the current program to temporarily stop what it is doing so that the OS can service the interrupt. It's like a signal to the OS to tell him, hey, um, I have a problem here, please help me to solve it. So for instance, um, let's say if your printer is out of paper, um, the computer will need to know to inform the user um, which will, in which this box will come up, which is um, a case of how interrupt is functioning, in which it tells that it sends an interrupt, that your printer sends an interrupt to your OS to show the user this message so that they can review the paper or review the ink. All right, so these are some of the examples of an interrupt. So let's look at how the interrupt is handled, the flow of how it's handled. So first of all, the device, um, it will send an interrupt signal. It could also be a software. And for instance, if these things happen, the device or the software will send an interrupt signal and this interrupt signal is collected by something called the interrupt handles. The interrupt handles. So before we talk about the next step, um, let's just look at um, our volume and architecture. So as mentioned in the hardware video, when a code needs to be executed, it need, the code needs to be moved from the secondary storage into the memory unit so that the CPU can process it. But if you think about it, if there are so many instructions that needs to be executed in one second, how does the computer decide which instruction to execute first? And this is where we lead into the inter inter interrupt service routine, in which just now we say that the interrupt is being collected by an interrupt handles. So um, based on how important the interrupt is, it will be assigned a priority and therefore placed in a queue. All right. It can be before the next task executed, or it could also be after each task is executed. And upon the completing a fetch decode execute cycle, the CPU will check the priority of the next interrupt to see if it has a higher priority than the current task being processed. Remember, if your computer, let's say, have a three gigahertz um, CPU, this means that they can execute three billion instruction at the same time. But then the CPU needs to know which instruction needs to be executed first. Therefore, this priority, when this is when the priority comes into play. So if here they said if the interrupt that is being sent to the CPU has a higher priority than the current task being executed, then the CPU will stop what it is doing and fetches the interrupt to the CPU to reprocess. However, if it has a lower priority, if the interrupt has a lower priority than the current task, it will leave the interrupt in the interrupt queue, okay, and carries on processing. So, in, in fact, this process happens so quickly, um, as I said, a computer can process billions of instructions in one second. Therefore, this process happens so quickly that it is impossible for the user to notice that the OS has been interrupted. And this interrupts the function of it is that they allow computers to carry out many tasks at the same time, which means interrupt can be sent at any time. It doesn't need to be executed first, but if it has a higher priority, then it will be executed. And for interrupt, you also need to know how to differentiate between software interrupt. For instance, um, when division of zero and try to process attempt to access the same memory location, which means that um, if, you, if there's an information here and you try to use this location to store another character, another data, then um, they will um, show you a software interrupt. 
whereas the hardware interrupts um, could be the press of a key on the keyboard or even the click of the mouse button. So, first of all, we learned that interrupt is a signal sent by device and programmed to the OS to cause a temporary stop. And the reason this interrupt is needed is so that the computers can run multiple, multiple tasks at the same time um, instead of being one after the other. And the two types of interrupt there are is first of all the software interrupt and also the, the hardware interrupt. And that's the end of this video. And in the next video, we are going to learn the different types of programming language available. I'll see you then. Goodbye. Hello everyone, welcome to this video. And in this video, we are going to learn the different types of programming languages available. And think of programming languages like a tool that helps us to create software. If you just recap on the definition of a software, it is a set of instructions written in programming language that perform one or more tasks to tell the computer what to do. And we will learn the different types of programming languages available to create all this software. And in fact, if you are interested, I have a ranking table here which shows which programming language is the most popular one. Um, I just want to say that it's not that one programming language is better than the other. It is just that different programming languages, they serve different purposes. Okay, so codes written in any language needs to be translated into machine code before it can be understood by a computer. So whether you are writing codes in a JavaScript, PHP, Python, or Java, all these codes will be translated by a translator to machine code to be processed. All right, because we learn in data representation chapter that computers can only understand binary. So that's why they have to be translated. So there are mainly two types of programming languages. One type is called a high level and the other one is called a low level. So let's first dive deeper into the high level programming language. So high level programming language, they contain English like words and terms that we can use in communication and are easier for high programmers to understand. And the reason they are called high level is not because they are better or faster, it's because they are very abstracted in terms of how um, user perceive how this data will be in, um, processed, which means that we don't have to know exactly how a print statement works in a computer. They will do it, they will translate it to code for us. Okay, so they also enable the programmer to focus on the problem to be solved, which means the logical part of the problem and require no knowledge of how this hardware and instruction set of the computer that we use the program which means the programmers that code in high level programming language, they don't have to know how this code turns out to be processed by the memory, by the CPU and such. Um, it's very high level, okay, and English-like. So um, here, so having talked about some high level programming languages, um, let's move on to low level programming languages. And it's something like that. Um, first, the first one is the machine code, which is zero and one they have another name called a machine code and if you think about it it is impossible for us to code in this format although this is the only way computer can understand data therefore we often code in high level programming language and then we let the software translate it into codes like that okay so the other types of um, another low level programming languages um, is known as the assembly language the assembly language here we have an example known as the MIPS programming language. So what this code does, as I will illustrate, is very, very straightforward. So here they say add A1, A1. So these are the stuff to be added, okay? And then store it into this location, okay? So what the computer will do upon um, the user writing this code is that we are essentially telling the computer, hey, take whatever that is inside the memory location A1, which is three. We add them together, like the verb here, we add them together and then store it back into location T0, okay, T0. So as you can see, in this programming languages, we are directly assessing the memory location, which we are directly assessing the RAM of the computer, which is specific, which is also harder but it is more convenient. Um, not convenient as in it's more straightforward. There is less abstraction in this um, types of writing. So that's why it's called low level. Um, it is 
comparatively low as compared to imagine if the CPU is here, your language will be your low level programming language will be here. You're accessing um, the hardware. Sorry, this should be the hardware directly. In other, if you look at high level programming language, they need to be translated to low level programming language before it can be processed by CPU. So this is the high and low level part of programming languages. Okay. So um, here they say some. Here are some properties of the assembly language. It's a type of programming that sits just above the machine code and it's low level language that use mnemonics and instructions and commands. So um, these are some of the mnemonics. Um, do memorize a few to just um, know that they are actually low level programming languages. Okay. So. Um, so why use assembly language to make use of specific special hardware? Like what I said just now, they're actually assessing the registers. Very Like all these symbols here, we're actually assessing the specific registers that is inside a computer, a CPU. And also these are the codes that doesn't take up much space in the primary memory because they don't need to be translated too much. It's less abstracted. And also they write code that perform a, very ta a task very easy, quickly. It makes sense because these codes, they don't need to be translated too much into machine code that needs to be understand. That's why they are a lot quicker than high level programming languages. So um, to compare and contrast um, high and low level programming languages, I also created in an acronym, which is does Harry eat my supper? You can just take the first character to remember what it is. So first D is debug for high level programming languages. So this is high level and this is low level, it is easier to debug because it's in English words. And as for the low level, it's harder to debug because the code is um, longer and also often harder to understand. And as for Hish, Harry, hardware, it is inefficient for high level programming languages in terms of hardware usage because you need computational power to con convert all this English-like code into binaries. And as for low level, it's able to directly manipulate computer hardware. All right, um, E stands for ease, easier to read and write for programmer. And as for the low level, it's more, challenge, more challenging. As I said, it's more challenging to write in machine code or assembly language. M stands for, takes up a lot of memory. memory. So for high level, it takes up more memory due to a layers of abstraction. And as for low level, it takes up little space, okay? And in terms of speed, high level programming in con um, doesn't imply by his name is that the executing time is slower because we need to take into consideration um, the converting time, the converting time. Okay. So um, as for the low level programming languages, um, its execution time is a lot faster. So in this, in this video, we learned that there are two different types of programming languages, the high level, which is more English like and a low level, which is more computer-like, in which they are faster, yet they are harder to write in terms of programming languages, all right? So um, don't worry, we will learn more about programming in chapter seven. Meanwhile, for now, you'll just have to remember how to categorize the two and what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of each. And I will see in the next video, we are going to learn about the translator, which is used to translate all these programming languages into machine code. I will see you then, goodbye. All right, hello everyone, welcome to this video. In this video, we're going to learn what a translator is. It is basically a piece of code that translates a, lang a programming language into machine code, as shown in this diagram here. So different programming languages, whether it's JavaScript, C++, or Python, they need to be converted into machine code, all right? Because this is the only language that computer can understand, the computer can understand. So. This is our focus in this video. What are the types of translator around to convert different types of programming languages? So um, the three types of translator here is the interpreter, the compiler, and also the assembly language, assembler. So um, I've, this doesn't mean that the interpreter only works for Python or C. I'm just putting it as an example, an example here, okay? So the main functions of the interpret the translator is to translate code in various programming languages into binary and also reports errors in the code to programmer. 
So let's look at the interpreter, the first type of translator. It interprets the code line by line in the program, and it will stop the execution of the code when it detects an error, and it will not produce an executable file at the end of the process. So let me show you an example of how interpreter would work in Python programming language. So how it works is that it will interpret code these code line by lines. So if if let's say in line number two, um, there's a bug here. This means that the program will just stop interpreting, and they will stop at this point to tell the user that hey, in line two of your programming code, there is an arrow here, and these codes will not be executed, not be executed, because interpreter work in a way that it translate in interpret the codes line by line and stops when there is an arrow. All right, so um, that's interpreter. As for compiler, it goes through an extra step called the compi compilation step in which it translates an entire program written in a high level language into machine code all in one go so that it can be directly used by computer to perform a single task. An executable file will be produced. So for instance, let's say this is your code here. So as contrast to um, as compared to interpret interpreter which interprets it line by line, what the compiler does is that they will convert this code into a bunch of executable code, all right, which is called the executable file. And then this executable file can be run by the CPU to perform action. Okay, action. And when the compiler is pr producing the executable file, it will also be able to detect whether an error has occurred or not, as shown in this. A report of error is produced at the end of the translation. And once the program is compiled, the com machine code can be used, which is the execute exe file, will be used again and again to perform the same task without recompilation. And I've attached a screenshot here to show you um, how I um, compile my C code, codes written in C programming language, into an executable file, and then run this executable file separately. All right, and this file will be able to run um, again and again without recompilation. So that's some features of a compiler. And next is the assembler, as implied by the name, it translates assembly language. It translates assembly language into machine code. And once the program is assembled, the machine code can be used over and over again, just like the compiler, um, without reassembly. So um, here are the comparisons of the different types of translators. Um, as you can see, for compiler, it produces executable file. An interpreter, it doesn't do that because it interpret the codes line by line. Assembler also produce executable file. And here are some of the languages they apply. Compiler and interpreter, they are used in high level. Assembler, since it is translating assembly language, which is a low level programming language, they do it for low level programming code. And the compiler is run without the compiler. An interpreter program cannot be run without the interpreter. Okay. So in this case, comp compiler is only to produce the exe file, but the exe file, when it's run, it won't need the compiler again, Sim similar to assembly program. So if you compare, um, if you look at assembler and compiler, they are very similar in nature. It's just that the compiler compile high level programming language and the assembler produce, um, translate low level programming languages. So these are the difference between interpreter and compiler. Um, interpreter, here they say easier for beginners as errors are easily identified. They will just let you know which line of the code you have a bug. And they are also easier and quicker to debug to test programs. And for interpreter, one setback is that they take longer to be executed. So um, as for compiler, they can be executed in a shorter time, and, but it takes a long, longer time to write tests and debug programs during developments. So that's all about um, translators. So we have learned three types of translators, the interpreters, the compilers, and also the assemblers, in which each of them have different function. They basically use to translate different types of code. And what you have to know is that what are their differences and what is their respective functions. So that's the end of this video. And in the next video, we are going to learn about the various function of an IDE. All right, and I'll see you soon. Goodbye.
Hello, welcome to this channel. So in this video, we are going to learn the seven features of an IDE. I figured that um, it's better for, for me to show you an IDE and explain each feature by providing an example instead of just um, giving a lecture about what all these features are about. So let's dive into it. So the first function uh, of an IDE is, is that it acts and as act code editor in which it's just a place where you can write your codes. So think of Microsoft Word and Google Doc as a software which you can write an essay. So an IDE is a place where you can write your codes, like what I am doing now, writing Python codes in this IDE called Visual Studio Code. All right. So um, the second method, which I can't display it here because it doesn't provide this function, but what it does is basically if I were to um, it deliberately write a typo here. Um, um, for certain ID software, they will just auto correct it to help me write in this correct variable name. All right. So the third feature of an IDE is auto completion. All right. So if I were to print the first um, first number variable instead of typing character by character, I can just type in the first character, and then it will recommend. Um, the one that I might be choosing, so which is this one, first number. So I can just click this. So that's how the auto completion method works for an IDE. And the next feature of an IDE is pretty print. So what this means is that an IDE will help you to print your codes in a manner which you can understand it better. If you look at it, um, colors, different colors have been assigned to different data type. So for instance, the variable is um, colored in blue in black, while the value of the variable is colored in green instead. All right. And then uh, we have blue color for the keywords, if else here. And also for, for the string, they assign the color red to it. So by doing this, by pretty printing our code, we are able to read our codes better in terms of um, what this data type is about, is this a keyword or not, and that um, helps us to write our codes better. All right, so um, the next feature of an IDE, not just this IDE, but also all types of IDEs is that they usually have some built-in translator function. Um, if you remember, um, the translator that we learned is interpreter, compiler, and also assembler. So instead of downloading this um, software, Elsewhere, usually IDE will provide a function where you can just run your codes in this IDE. So I'll run this program. So as you can see, the play button here. So that's um the translator in action. It converts this code into machine code, which the computer can understand, and interpret it line by line. Remember, um, Python is interpreted; it's an interpreted language, and then it produces the outcome. All right. So um, the next feature of an IDE is that it provides error diagnostic function. Okay, if I were to um, deliberately cancel out one character here, and the IDE will notify me that hey, I can't find this variable. All right, um, here what it, this is what they say: FIRS number is not defined, and this is the types of error diagnostic. Imagine that you your code has thousands and uh, millions of lines, you need to know where it goes wrong very quickly. And this is how IDE serves as a great help for you to debug your program. Okay, so I just put it back. So it should be first, the auto completion function. And last but not least, um, an IDE also provides a runtime environment and which uh, basically an environment which you can run your codes and produce an outcome, All right? So that's um, the seven features of an IDE. So let me know if you have any question in the command section. And um, these are all the features of an ID that you need to remember. Thank you so much for watching. See you.